Take your Bibles and turn with me to Proverbs chapter three, if you will. Proverbs three. For those of you who are here today or maybe watching online or maybe watch later, uh, my name is Matt Stewart. I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Christ Community. And uh, I'm thankful for uh, the Lord giving Ronnie and Marcy a chance to rest today and to get to fill the pulpit for him. And I look forward to looking to God's word with you. Before we do that, let's open uh, with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the immense privilege of getting to come and worship with your people. And I ask now, Holy Spirit, that you would prepare our hearts to receive the food of your word. And that, in fact, you would take it you take the seed of your truth and you would plant it in our hearts that it would take root, that it would bear fruit and produce lasting fruit to the glory of your name. If there's anyone here who does not have the hope of eternity, may today be the day when they turn from their sin to trust in Christ alone. Father, I pray that my speech and my message would not be with plausible words of wisdom, but that they would be a demonstration of your wisdom, and of your power, so that our faith wouldn't rest in the wisdom of mere men, but in the power of Almighty God. We dedicate this time to you and ask these things by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. On April 8th, 2018, I stood before my church family in Maryland and resigned as their pastor. I could sugarcoat it for you and make it sound better than what it actually was, uh, but the reality is I was suffering from a nervous breakdown. And that moment, standing before my church family sobbing as I resigned was, I can say unequivocally, the most humiliating moment of my entire life. The beautiful but difficult work of pastoral ministry over the previous four and a half years had taken its toll, and now I was in a place where I was having chest pains and sleepless nights and a fluctuation of emotions, going to the ER thinking I'm having a heart attack, despair, depression, all of the above. But it was in that moment, and I didn't know it at the time, but in that moment that God was beginning to do a brand new work in my life. And that the discipline of the Lord that I was experiencing was not a sign that God had abandoned me or didn't love me, but quite the opposite. Truth be told, in a room of this size with this many people, there are probably lots of, um, how, how would we put it, cringeworthy stories, right? Those moments we would rather keep secret, no one else know about, the moments in our lives that were humiliating where we were brought to our knees. But in a sense, while we don't glory in those moments in and of themselves, we rejoice because we know that it's in our weakness that God meets us. It's in the moment when we are brought to the end of ourself, face on the ground, in the fetal position, that God begins to transform us and to shape us. And as we draw this series to a close in Proverbs chapter 3, I want us to see, specifically from verses 11 through 12, but I want us us to read that whole passage once again, to see the heart of our Father and His plan for us and the purpose behind His discipline. Proverbs chapter 3, read with me. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, 
Do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son, in whom he delights. If you don't get anything else from this message, I hope you'll walk away with this, the main idea. And that is that true godliness flows from a trusting submission to the Lord's process of spiritual growth. True godliness flows from a trusting submission to the Lord's process of spiritual growth. And unfortunately, maybe we could say that from a human standpoint, there is no shortcut. If one thinks of the infomercials you see come on TV of if you put this belt around your waist, you can have a six pack and it will melt fat off of your body as if that was a great shortcut to losing weight and getting the body you want. Actually, it doesn't work like that. And that's the same thing for growing in wisdom or being a godly person. It is a lifelong relationship with God, walking with him day by day, submitting to his process of spiritual growth. But there are two aspects of verses 11 and 12 that we need to not only understand, but we need to embrace them if we're to go on that journey and grow in true godliness. Look at verse 11 and 12 with me here again. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father the son in whom he delights. The first thing I want you to see this morning is the command we are to obey. Don't resist God's discipline in your life. Don't resist it. Now that might sound self-explanatory, but the reality is, is we're going to be learning what that means for the rest of our lives. Because God's discipline comes into our lives in all kinds of ways. In fact, in humility, we have to admit this morning that we're not always sure of what God is doing in our lives. It's hard for us to pin down whether God is judging the wicked or he's pruning his church or disciplining you in particular or he's allowing the natural consequences of a sinful world to come into play. And the reality is if we had to pin down an answer, we would have to say, yes. Why? Because God is potentially doing 10,000 different things through the one thing that you and I can see. And so we have to admit in humility there is mystery to God and his ways. And yet for those who are in Christ, that is, you've repented of your sin and trusted in Jesus, you have the hope of knowing God's discipline in your life is always from the hand of your Father for your good. Never for wrathful purposes against your sin because Jesus took that at the cross. Instead, God is shaping you, fitting you for an eternity with him. So, how does God reveal the ways in which he disciplines his children throughout Scripture? It's a good question. Glad you asked. So, two answers to that. Again, acknowledging there's mystery to God's ways. Number one, he often brings about corrective discipline in our lives. Corrective discipline. This form of discipline protects God's children by inflicting pain that warns them to steer clear of sin's destructive consequences. So God introduces suffering so that we will avoid the long-term consequences of sinful choices. We see a few examples of this in Psalm 119, verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. See the correction taking place there? Or 1 Corinthians eleven thirty two, 32. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined. See the two there? It's not that we are being punished for sin, because Jesus took that for us, but instead we are being disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. God is protecting us from sin's consequences by disciplining us. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, 
my siblings and I were spanked by my parents. And looking back, I realized I probably deserved a lot more spankings than I actually got. They were very gracious. Now that I'm a father of six children. And oftentimes I tried to hide from the consequences of a spanking by putting multiple layers of underwear on, but it was always discovered and so it never really worked in the end. But what my mom and dad would do is they would spank us, but then they would do something interesting that has actually shaped uh, my wife and I's parenting a great deal. And that is that they would take me and they would hold me until I stopped crying. And sometimes that was minutes if I really wanted them to know how badly it hurt, you know, got to produce the tears. But they would hold me until I stopped crying, and then they would set me on their knee or look at me and say, honey, I love you. This is why I spanked you. And then they'd pray with me. And in the moment, it wasn't enjoyable, but I realize now that there was a world of security and, and love that I enjoyed as a child because my parents were willing to discipline me in that way. Now, one of the reasons why our kids rebel the way they do is because we're not faithful to discipline them when they're young. One of the ways, or one of, one of the reasons why. And that is because we allow children to do whatever they want to when they're small, but when they get older and become teenagers and do what teenagers do, all of a sudden we try to put the clamps down on them and they rebel and we wonder what's going on. What discipline does is it starts early and it trains us to understand right from wrong, wise from unwise, where the boundaries are, who are the good authorities in my life, and why I should heed this path. And as a result, as we get older, we're given more freedom and responsibility because we can be trusted to do what's right. Think for a moment then what it would be like if God our Father didn't discipline his children. He would be condemning us to a life of suffering consequences from sinful choices. He loves you and I too much to let us go that way. And so God brings this corrective discipline into our lives to shield us from those things. But he also brings formative discipline into our lives. Formative discipline in our lives. And this form of discipline trains God's children to grow in godliness by introducing trials, suffering, pain, that's meant to stretch our faith in God in obedience to his word. And it teaches us to say no to sin's enticements. I love that moment whenever you watch uh, the Olympic Games or you watch the Super Bowl and there's that moment where, especially in the Olympics since those are coming up, you have the person standing on the podium and you see the flag dropping in the background and you hear the national anthem and the person is crying and they've got the gold medal around their chest and you're crying sitting there on your couch, you haven't done anything, but you're crying and you're watching. But as we've said before, behind that moment of glory and joy are years of suffering, years of discipline, years of training, of denying self of things that one wants and beating one's body into submission so as to be able to perform at the highest level and to enjoy the freedom of victory. And that's precisely what God does in our lives through the process of sanctification. That's a big word for saying that God is making us like Jesus by disciplining us. Not only through corrective discipline, but through disciplines like going to church and reading the Bible, and praying, and journaling, and sharing our faith, and serving others. In other words, practices that teach us who he is and how to live for him. And as we practice those things, they become more second nature, and God, by his grace, makes us more like his son, Jesus Christ. And sometimes God brings about this formative discipline in our lives through suffering through trials. 
so that we'll avoid the consequences of sin, but not only that, so that we can grow in grace. That's precisely what the writer of Hebrews has in mind. In Hebrews chapter 12, he actually quotes Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, and listen to what he says. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which, we, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. In 1895, Andrew Murray, who was a pastor in South Africa, was staying at a guest home while traveling for preaching. And one morning he lay in bed because his back, which he injured a few years prior, was causing him severe pain, couldn't even get out of bed. And when his hostess brought him breakfast, she told him that a troubled woman had come to the house seeking his counsel. Murray handed her a piece of paper and said, just give her this advice I'm writing down for myself. It may be that she'll find it helpful. And this is what he wrote. In time of trouble, say first, God brought me here. It is by his will I am in this straight place. In that I will rest. Next, he will keep me here in his love and give me grace in this trial to behave as his child. Then say, he will make the trial a blessing, teaching me lessons he intends me to learn and working in me the grace he means to bestow. And last, in his good time, he can bring me out again, how and when he knows. Therefore say, I am here, one, by God's appointment, two, in his keeping, three, under his training, and four, for his time. No one enjoys the pain of discipline. If you do, we have counseling for that as well. But the point of pain is to train us to love God and to treasure him above everything else so that we enjoy the freedom of walking in a relationship with the Lord rather than being weighed down by the supposed pleasures of sin. It tastes good, it feels good, it looks good, and then we take and we eat and we find it was a lie all along. God brings discipline into our lives because he's too good of a father to let us continue in our own ways. So we need to remember this command. Don't despise God's discipline. Don't be weary of it. God is showing you he is your father and he loves you and he's preserving you. And that leads us to the second thing that I want you to see from this passage. There is a truth we must rest in. And that is that God disciplines his children in love. God disciplines his children in love. Listen to the consistent testimony of Scripture from one end to the other. Deuteronomy 8.5 Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. Psalm 119.75 I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Or Revelation 3.19 to the church at Laodicea Those whom I love... I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Unfortunately, for many of us, this truth that God disciplines us in love is really hard to accept. And that's because either you didn't grow up with a father figure in your home, 
or because the father figure or other authority figures in your life were harsh, dismissive, or even abusive. And the last thing I want you to hear me say this morning is that you just need to suck it up and get over it. In fact, I want you to hear me say that we love you. We want to know your story. We want to pray with you. And frankly, if you'll let us, we want to walk with you down that grace-filled path toward healing. If you look around here, these aren't a bunch of self-made people who've got it all together. They're people who are broken and who have been redeemed and are being restored because of Christ. So you're in good company. So let us walk with you. But what I do want you to hear from me this morning is that God is inviting you, if you'll trust him, to know the kind of love and protection a father should give. In fact, to know the infinite love of the father himself. What is this father like? Well, we could go for weeks or months or years talking about the attributes of God. But for a moment, I just want us to zero in on sort of the core of who he is so that you might have a better picture of who it is that you're being called to trust in the midst of discipline. You need to know that God the Father is holy. He's perfect. He's flawless. And that's why scripture says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Not only is he holy, he's eternal. Moses says the eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. But this holy eternal God is also the sovereign God of the universe. Paul says he is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He does all that he pleases. And he's unchanging. Thank goodness he is unchanging. Numbers 23, God is not man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? And that's good news because he's also good. That's why the psalmist says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And he's so wise. He's infinitely wise, which is why Paul exalts there at the end of Romans chapter 11, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. And he's just. He always does what is right. The rock, his work is perfect. For all his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. And this same God is a loving, tender God. Zephaniah 3, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. So the reality is, even if you could get rid of discipline and suffering from your life, you wouldn't be better off for it. Why is that? Ray Ortland puts it wisely. He says, if you could remove suffering not only from your own life, but also from the whole world, you would not improve it. You would rob yourself of significance. You would create a world without the love of God. It would be a world where Jesus himself could not suffer and die for your or anyone's sins. Because as Romans 5, 8 says, God has demonstrated his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So while without dismissing your background and your prior experiences, Scripture and God the Father himself is inviting you to know him, to trust him, to come under his shelter, his protection, and to know that the pain or the discipline that he brings into your life is not to make you squirm. It's not to watch you suffer. It's so that you will be fit for an eternity with him. 
It's so that you will be able to look at him with joy and gladness in his presence and count him your treasure, as we sang about a few moments ago. He is a loving father who cares too much about you to let you continue in the condition that you're in. And this is important because, I don't know about you, but sometimes my heart is like a terrible two-year-old. Do you know what I mean by that? Where I'm constantly stomping, where I'm saying, no, I don't want it, no thank you, not even that polite, just no. So what God does is that he gently, with good intentions, with perfect intentions because of who he is, brings trials into our lives so that we might learn to yield to him and to his strength. And in doing so, there's actually joy because then God proves our faith. That's why D.A. Carson says, the staying power of our faith is neither demonstrated nor developed until it is tested by suffering. Or, as James put it in James chapter 1, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. In other words, God is preserving you. How can we rest assured that we as sinful human beings will persevere to the end so that we get to live with him in heaven? Well, it's not because of the strength of our character. It's not because of our resolve. It's because a loving father brings about discipline in our lives so that we avoid the path that leads to sin and damnation and instead we enjoy the path of righteousness. It is good then that our Father disciplines us, even when we can't understand everything surrounding why we're going through what we're going through. D.A. Carson also told a story in which on a trip to Australia, he says he met an Anglican bishop who had been mightily used in evangelism and church planting in three African nations. He was sometimes referred to as the Apostle of Tanzania. And after he retired from his missionary work in Africa, he set up a seminary in the United States. But when I met him, his suffering from Parkinson's disease was so advanced that he could no longer talk. He could communicate just barely by printing out block letters in a wavering hand that was almost indecipherable. He often had to draw a word three or four times for me to understand him. We talked about a number of matters close to his heart. At least I did the talking and tried to ask most of my questions in a form where he could signal merely yes or no. In the short time I spent with him, I sensed a man of unshaken faith. And so I had the audacity to ask him how he was coping with his illness. After decades of immensely productive activity, how was he dealing with his own suffering? with the temptation to feel he was now useless and fruitless. He pinned his answer twice before I could make it out. There is no future in frustration. Which is why the Apostle Paul can say of his own thorn in the flesh given to him by God, but the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content. I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Brothers and sisters, we're not saying that pain in and of itself is good. There's nothing intrinsically valuable about your child dying, about being diagnosed with cancer, 
about losing your job or financial hardship or contracting COVID or any other form of suffering you could list. What we are saying is, is that this holy, good, wise, sovereign, just, loving God is working all of that for his glory and for our good so that one day when we stand before him face to face, our pain will cease and our tears will be wiped away. And we will know as we look him in the face that every form of suffering we had on this earth was worth it for the joy of seeing him. We're not living for the next promotion. We're not living for that boat, for that house, for that car, for that spouse, for that kid, for whatever it is. If it is, you will be immensely disappointed. And that's one of the reasons why God brings us through discipline. It's so that our grip on the things of this world will be loosened and so that we'll see that Christ alone is our treasure. It's in him that our hearts can be satisfied. How unloving would God have to be if knowing that discipline brings about eternal joy to withhold that from us and instead to let us wander off into the consequences of our sin. He's too good of a father to do that. So I'm not saying that we should walk out of here saying, I need me some discipline. Can't wait to suffer. I'm not saying that. I am saying that you trust the heart of your father. And you understand that this life is not about your comfort about your affluency, about getting all the stuff you want. Even the pharaohs of Egypt took all their treasures with them, and guess what? Their treasures are still there. What I am saying is that God loves you and is preparing you for an incomparable weight of glory. So if you find yourself, as a Christian this morning, In the midst of suffering, quickly here, I'll talk fast, you listen fast. I want to give you just a few points of application to help you as you are walking through this season of suffering. Number one, ask the Lord to search your heart. Pray what the psalmist did in Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Don't be the sin cop in your life. Instead, ask the Holy Spirit to show you what you yourself cannot see. Number two, once he shows you, flee from sin and eliminate temptation from your life. God is making you like his son Jesus, so don't play around with sin. Don't act as if it's not a big deal. All you have to do is look to a cross and see your Savior hanging from there to understand The cost of your sin is weighty, so flee from it. Number three, continue trusting in the finished work of Jesus. There will never be a moment in this life where you stop trusting in him, where you stop turning from sin. He is your hope. He is your righteousness. He is your peace, and he will forever be those things. So keep looking to him. Keep looking to the cross. Keep looking to the empty tomb and realize that it's in him that you have hope. Number four, cultivate a relationship with God defined by intense delight. Or in other words, what verse seven of Proverbs three says, fear the Lord. It is the ultimate expression of worshipful delight in the person of God when we come to be so in awe of him that we both rejoice and tremble. And the only way that happens is by walking with him day after day, opening his word and listening to him speak and beholding in the face of Jesus Christ his glory, like 2 Corinthians 3 and 4 says. Number five, surround yourself with godly brothers and sisters in Christ. You cannot make it through suffering by being on an island by yourself. So when we talk to you week after week about go to the next, ste- next steps table and you can learn about growth track and you can learn about membership and community groups and serving, we're not just saying those are good things to do. Number one, we want you to walk in obedience to Christ's commands, but number two, 
Part of our job as your pastors is to help prepare you for the inevitable suffering that is to come. Which means that you need to be serving alongside brothers and sisters. You need to be able to identify as a member of a local church. You need to be in a community group where people know your name and are praying for you and are walking through life with you because you will not make it on your own. These are good gifts that God has supplied to you. So don't dilly-dally anymore. Get serious about being a faithful member of a local church. If not Christ community, some Bible-preaching, gospel-centered church in our area. But don't live alone on an island by yourself. And number six, trust God loves you when you can't understand what he's doing in you. I believe it was William Cooper, the 18th century hymn writer, who said, behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. In other words, there are moments when we can't see what God is doing. But we know who he is because he's revealed himself in the person of his son. And therefore, we have reason to have hope that he loves us in the midst of our pain. For some of us this morning, we don't have the hope of Christ because you're still in your sins. Quoting a friend, C.S. Lewis said, We regard it, God as an airman regards his parachute. It's there for emergencies, but he hopes he'll never have to use it. And thus, he argues, pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. If you're an unbeliever and you find yourself in the midst of pain, know then that God doesn't mean to do you harm, but instead to have you wake up. Wake up! To turn to him and live. Why will you die in your sins when he is holding out the offer of the gospel? Repent of your sins, trust in Christ alone, and you will have the joy of eternity with him. So what what is it that you're hearing today? What is your pain saying? I pray that it says that you need to turn to Christ and live. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that in your mercy you bring your children, your sons and your daughters through pain and suffering and discipline not to harm us but ultimately to restore us to likeness to yourself and to fit us for an eternity with you. Help us to keep trusting in you. And when we're tempted to question your love, would you help us to look to the cross and be reminded that it's because of your son's suffering and obedience to your commands that we have the hope of eternal life. And if there's anyone here today, Father, who doesn't have that hope in the midst of their pain, Lord, please, in your mercy, open their eyes, open their hearts, open their ears, that they would repent of their sin, turn their back on it, and put all of their hope in Jesus Christ and him alone. Lead them to find one of our pastors today or go to the next steps table or to turn to someone next to them and say, I need the hope of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for being a good father. Help us to trust you in all our ways. We ask these things by faith in Jesus' name. Amen.